Hey everyone and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. Today we have two encounters. Our first guest is Dave and his encounter took place in East Texas while hunting out in the woods. Our second guest is Michael who is a combat veteran and he experienced some unusual activity while hunting in the mountains of Idaho. If you guys can please hit the like and subscribe button and if you have a cryptid encounter that you would like to share please contact me at Sasquatch Theory at Outlook.com. All right, everyone, we have a lot to go through and a lot to cover, so let's get straight into it. All right, Dave, welcome to Sasquatch Theory. How are you doing today, sir? Oh, pretty good. And you? Not too bad. Dave, if you would, tell us a little bit about yourself and the encounter that you had in East Texas. Okay, this this encounter happened quite a few years ago, 1971 to be exact, when I was 11. So that puts me at 62 now. And uh, I spent a little time in East Texas growing up before I finally moved away. But then... Uh, recent years my dad asked me to come back and help him with his land and livestock because i have family that's been in this area we're in trinity county been in this area since 1836 it's the same year davy crockett passed through these parts and route to the alamo so we've had family here for a while well, uh back to 71 needless to say hunting's a pretty big deal <laughs> especially in this part of texas and so uh, it was fall, and my, my dad took me and a brother who was just a year younger than me deer hunting just a few miles to the west of Groton. Groton's a county seat of Trinity County. And uh, the area is known as Westville, and it's uh, not really many people live there. And like I said, it's only a few miles west of Groton, and it's right where 287, which goes up to Crockett, 94, which goes to Trinity. It's sort of those diverge and go their separate ways. So it's the very southern part of the Davy Crockett National Forest. So, uh, whatever, back to the day in question. Like I said, I was 11, and my dad, he'd drive us out very, very rural area. In, in the the woods there we drive to the end of a dirt road and he'd park and we'd get there well before sunrise and it was a crisp november morning probably about 50 degrees or so and he would point a flashlight straight down the ground and lead first my brother to his stand and then me to mine and then my dad would sort of swing around head north of us and then come back from north to south drive making a drive so we'd both be really still hunting on our stands and you know he had access to anything that he saw that he might jump he might take a shot at so he'd get us out there early and we'd sit there in the, the dark and wait for the sun to rise more or less and listen to the sounds and so that particular morning i'm sitting there waiting it just got to that point where it's not dark, but it's not daylight yet. It's sort of a gray, and you start to hear the birds singing, the little animals stirring and stuff like that. And Needless to say, uh, we were actually pretty decent hunters, my brother and I, even though we were young, because my dad was Army infantry, and he had marksmanship badges, and he was no nonsense in the woods, so he taught us to be the same, the same and be very respectable of uh, critters and people alike. So, I'm sitting there on my stand, and when I say stand, I basically sit with my back against a small oak tree, so I had my legs extended in front of me, I'm leaning against it, I'm left-handed, I had a 410 shotgun with it, one single shot, and it had a slug in it, so I got the gun resting, the butt of the gun against my left shoulder, and the gun's out, hanging off my right leg so i sort of have it at an angle across my body so i can easily raise it and swing it in any direction shooting from a sitting position so it was uh, the sun had just become 
who had come up, it was starting to get pretty light then where I, I could see really well. I heard back to my right and behind me, I could hear footballs in the distance. And we had never seen anybody out there. And this person, I'm thinking it's a big man. That was the sound of it, walking to the woods, making a lot of noise. And I, my first thought is probably the worst word I knew at that time in my life. I thought, who, what a jackass, because I'm thinking anybody that's out there is hunting. But then as I begin to think this, I think, well, if this person's hunting, why, why aren't they trying to be quiet? You wouldn't walk that way through the woods. It was just football, step, step, step. And it was a dry morning the, so I could hear the leaves crunching as it got closer and closer. At that point, I, I really began to feel fear because I started dealing, trying to deal with what am I going to do when this, because it sounded like the person's going to walk up on, on me. And I think, how do I let him know? I keep thinking him, it's a big, big man. How am I going to let him know that I'm sitting here without alarming him and, you know, having him do something crazy like fire his gun or whatever. And I'm just going through this craziness in my mind, what to do, what to do, what to do. And it's getting closer and closer and closer. And I was really at a loss to what to do. And suddenly just came to the stop. And it was only about 15 feet back into my, again, back into my right. And I'm sitting there trying not to move a muscle. And I have my chin down in my chest. And at that point, I could actually see it. And 2020 hindsight, I realized I, I tried to make it into something that I knew. I'm thinking, is this a horse? Is, that, is it a cow? And I'm looking, and it's sort of backlit by the sun. I realized it's a large figure that looks sort of like a, a very well-built ape, but it's, stand, it's standing up. And I'm looking up at it, and from that, from that angle, I could tell it was big. And my dad's six feet tall, and needless to say, I saw him come and go a lot of times while I was sitting on this stand. So relative to his height, I knew it was probably, it was, I'd say, just a little over six feet tall, six, two, six, three, maybe, but very well put together. And as I'm sitting there, I, another 2020 hindsight, I realized I probably would have fainted from fear if I wouldn't have been in the sitting position because I was that terrified of what I was looking at. And I'm using my peripheral vision, trying not to make a move whatsoever. And at that point, I realized it's breathing really sort of heavily. And I thought, for some reason, I had a very <laughs> clear thought of, we shouldn't be that winded from that exertion. It wasn't walking that. And then I realized it's not breathing hard from the exertion of walking. It's actually picking up my scent. That's what it was doing. And I could just hear. <clears throat> and then suddenly it just went. <clears throat> just let out this disgusted. Like it was disgusted with what is smelling grunt. And it turned and started walking away. To my left back sort of at an angle away from me and so uh, i realized at that point i was probably i would say more or less in a state of shock i i think it probably stood there about 15 seconds or so i'm not really sure like i said i think i came close to fainting. i don't know if i actually did for an instant but it, I, I was just absolutely terrified by what this was and there was nothing that I'd ever heard of even that would set me up for what I was looking at because in elementary school, I'd heard kids talking about the goat man and stuff like that. And even then I thought, well, the goat man, that's just something people made up that to scare kids who are out parking on these country roads and things like that. But whatever I'd heard of the goat man didn't sound anything like this. I'd never heard of Bigfoot or Sasquatch or anything like that. So it was just something I had I had no idea, and I was so really in shock. I I didn't mention it to my dad. I did, I just feel like I really repressed the memory. And then the next year that the movie The Legend of Boggy Creek came out, we went and saw that. And when I saw that, the light 
just went on in my head. I thought, oh, my, that's that's what walked up on me in the woods that morning. And you just say I sort of I wasn't afraid of the woods anymore, but I just there was something in there sort of bigger than all of us, and I really lost any desire to hunt after that, and I stopped hunting. And, uh, that was that was just one of those things I'll never forget. It some some at some moments I actually can revisit it in my mind, and it's just so clear the thoughts I had and what I was looking at and the emotions that I felt. But uh, again, that was a long time ago, and uh, that probably wouldn't have become. It sort of my mind regurgitated it after I had this instance in Southern California. I'm a I'm a, an avid runner and I was running with a Navajo friend of mine. We were doing a long run to to raise funds for Native American groups. And we were in the southern part of Colorado, right near the Mexican uh, New Mexico border on high little highway seventeen that runs down in New Mexico into Chama. And uh we were climbing up to a mountain pass is 10,230 feet in the Manga, the mountain pass. And up there, it sort of overlooks the Caneos, the river valley and stuff like that. And we would do two mile segments, two miles and stop, take a short break. And we had a support crew bands in front and behind us. And so on, as we neared the mountaintop, we got to a stopping point. We stopped. My friend let out sort of a whoop. whoop like that and we just heard it echo through the woods begin echoing down through the valley and in the woods just below us something it was just the most terrifying roar growl scream i would ever and still have ever heard in my life it did it three times and you could tell it was directed at us and we just looked at each other and it made i could feel it in my body and it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up and i looked at my friend and said what the hell was that? And he said, let's go. But it was interesting that as we talked about that in the days that followed, he more or less made it clear to me from a Native American standpoint, I'm part Native American, uh, Lumbee Indian and Cherokee Indian, that the Navajo believed that, you know, there is an animal that like that, that, you know, what we call a Sasquatch, they don't actually call it a Sasquatch, you call it more like a yay, Y-E-I. And uh, it's sort of something that's up in the mountains and it takes care of everything up in the mountains. And it's a, it's sort of a, almost a spiritual being, but it's, it's something that is real and tangible. And that, that happened in the 2000. And that really triggered all my memories of that that happened to me when I was 11. And at that point, I got pretty gung-ho about doing research and just looking up other people's encounters and seeing the similarities among what happened to me and some of the others. And so that's sort of it in a nutshell, how one thing really triggered another that happened years ago. So that's it at this point. So if I missed out on anything, let me know and I'll, I'll try to clarify it. Okay. Yeah, if you would, can you describe any of the features that you've seen on the creature, or did you just see the silhouette? Well, I could, I could see the, the best I could do at this point is the, the hair. It was chocolate brown, and with the sun shining, the sun, the light behind it, it seemed to give it a you know red tint. And unfortunately, since it was looking at me and I'm using my peripheral vision, it's its face and the front of it really in shadow. But for some reason to this day, I'm I'm convinced it was a, a male. Just I don't know, sort of the way it acted. And and so I didn't really get a good look at its face. And I, I know I wrote this in the report I sent you. Uh, even today, I'm I sort of kick myself thinking, why didn't I just lean a little further and look directly at it instead of using my peripheral vision? But at the same, by the same token, I think if I would have done something like that, would it have perceived that as a threat? And I, I'll never know that. But like I said, it's that sort of grunt huff that it let out sort of let me know it was 
wasn't happy about me being there or it it's walk being interrupted wherever it was headed so uh i guess i'm glad i didn't look right at it but if i had i i would have definitely seen it better but i i saw really enough of it to to see the the form and the hair the hair color could you tell if the shape of the head was round or conical shaped oh i'd say definitely conical and some the angle I was looking at, its head looked small to me, and I realized it's because I'm looking up, and it its head did sort of come to a point, and its head was set down in its shoulders. You know, it didn't really have a neck the way a person, but it was just sort of really built well. I I think I I wrote this as a a footnote in in a report. Uh, when I when my son was young, I took him to a lot of San Diego, him and neighborhood kids to San Diego Chargers. Some their summer camps and stuff like that, the training camps. And the the late junior Seau was a very formidable linebacker, and he he played for the Chargers at that point. And I remember one after one practice, he took off his shoulder pads and looking at him, and I thought that's about the way that thing looked to me, like it was built. You know, like I said, it was hair covered, but it looked like it was put together very well yeah and i would say it, it's uh, yeah so it was just six one two three something like that but it, it would have probably been 250 pounds i would guess but it it seemed sort of very muscular and there was no excess on this thing okay and um could you smell anything at the time no, I, I really didn't. Other than the the usual woodsy, gamey smell that you smell in the wood when I'm out in the woods, I I couldn't. The wind was blowing toward me, sort of. So it was behind me a little, but I didn't. I know a lot of people have said they smell a really skunky odor. Or something. I nothing really. Other than the usual woodsy smells, that but I didn't notice anything distinct from it. Yeah. And what angle did the creature come up at? Like kind of quartering to behind you? Well, if I if I'm looking ahead at say I'm looking ahead at my twelve o'clock, it would be about four four o'clock at the hand, so not direct to my right, just a little behind the right. It was coming from the right direction. And when it left it would have been leaving at about my eight o'clock. So sort of it came and went at similar angles to how I was sitting. That's another thing I think about. It It probably, the way it was trying to scent me out, I'm sure it, the way it was breathing, I'm, that tells me that it probably smelled me before it saw me because it wouldn't have been able to see that much of me because I'm, I'm, needless to say, I'm sitting, I'm 11, so I'm small, so I'm very low down at the near the bottom of this tree but just my it only seemed the very right maybe my right shoulder and my legs out so i'm sure it smelled me before it's it saw me but it when it stopped it stopped abruptly because it was step 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 then suddenly it would just stop okay so. what do you think the sasquatch are and have you ever heard any other reports from that exact area but I, I couldn't really say what they are. I, I've heard of a Gigantopithecus blackie, which is, they've found, I think, some maybe fossil. And over, it's just something sort of related to that, sort of ape, ape-like, but with a human flavor, so to speak. But uh, somewhere between a human and, and an ape, but definitely an an animal with higher reasoning i would say and uh i have heard other reports in in this vicinity in 2016 just up the road from here in angelina county just south of lufkin and boggy the slough there's a slough there in nature's, nature's river bottom supposedly this guy was out on a deer stand and as the day morning grew long, he 
he sort of had given up on the deer and uh, some a sound or a hogs emerged from the woods and so he decided to shoot the biggest pig and when he shot it uh, a large upright walking creature emerged from the woods grabbed the down hog picked it up and slammed it against a tree and then walked back into the woods with it and that, uh, a friend of my dad's told that story because uh, uh, so this is a friend of a friend uh, one of his buddies was guiding hunts and had put that the guy the hunter on that stand and he said when he came out to the stand to get the guy the guy was cowering down the bottom of the stand saying it's going to kill me it's going to kill me and he asked him to explain what happened the guy told him about shooting the pig and this thing coming and taking the pig and the guy said he walked over and he found blood on the ground and found blood up in the tree trunk where it had slammed it against there and so that's really only a few miles up the road where the Natchez River crosses 94 in that area. And that's probably 20 miles from here. So that's in more recent times. That's something that I've heard of in these parts. Yeah, that is interesting. I've taken reports from East Texas, and I've also heard a lot of frightening encounters, I think, from Sasquatch Chronicles. And there's all kinds of stories out there. What do you think makes East east texas so unique compared to the rest of the state like why are the sasquatch preferring that area compared to the rest of texas well it's heavily wooded here and there's a lot of game and there's a lot of areas that are just very very rural very remote mm -hmm. so you know i hate to bring this up but in recent times, there was that convict that escaped not terribly far from here. And they had hundreds of law enforcement people looking at him for weeks on in, and they couldn't find him. And we're talking about a man. So if you know, the woods and everything offer can offer that much cover to a, to a man, then you, know, you think of a wild animal, how easy it would be for something like that to sort of not not be found out in these parts but there it is it's some very rural very wooded a lot of water a lot of rivers creeks ponds lakes so there's not anything needed to sustain all sorts of game yeah it sounds like a very diverse habitat have you ever experienced any UFO activity, any orbs, any paranormal phenomenon in your life? No, not not really. I I can say to me I saw an unidentified flying object once when I was I lived in Southern California for years. It was a chevron shaped lights. The lights weren't blinking like an airplane, it was moving at a very high rate of speed but at that point i was i was living close enough to the miramar where which was top gun at the time that i assumed it was some sort of military craft but it was it was different than any of the others i'd seen because i'm very into air aircraft and so i know pretty much what everything is up there i see but this was at night and it was like i said chevron shape and the lights weren't blinking like an airplane was and it was it was moving on, whatever it was. And then there were some trailers. And by that, I mean, I saw following up behind it, aircraft, which were definitely aircraft. So I, that's one of those, I still sort of wonder what it is that I saw that time. And probably best guess, something experimental, I, I don't know. Yeah, it could but have no, been a secret I, prototype or possibly a UFO. Yeah, I'm not really sure. The, like I said, the thing that stood out was the, you know, I, like I said, it was dark. The, the lights weren't blinking. They were just kind of white, white, very bright, and flat colored, not, like I said, not blinking, but it did have aircraft following it. So that, that sort of led me to believe that it was something military related. Yeah. And going back to your encounter, you said you stopped hunting after the 
the experience? Uh, that and the, like I said, the legend of Boggy Creek. Needless to say, like I said, that the light definitely went on then, and I realized so much that I saw in that movie looked so similar to the areas we hunted, and that movie scared the hell out of me when I when I realized because they did sort of portray the what they call the felt monster sort of as a vindictive it shows it sort of coming back at that house near the end of it and going after people and stuff like that and that that was just pretty scary to me at that point you know being 12 years old and seeing that and i'm thinking is that what you know that looks or sounds exactly like what i saw in the woods that day and i just didn't want any part of that yeah i bet that hit home when they said that it's based on a true story yep uh huh. But to be honest, I I don't think these they're aggressive creatures based on territorial. Yes, but I don't think they would would be out, outwardly aggressive. What what we heard in Col Southern Colorado at that time, for example, to me that was seemed like more a territorial response. It heard that whoop, which could be construed as it sounds sort of like an whoop, you know, which needless say that elicited the response from whatever it was because it was it was in the 20s that morning and we're in the middle of nowhere running along this highway so nobody was in the woods just messing with us that day that was some sort of animal that made that response and we all after talking about agreed that's probably what it was a sasquatch responding to that whoop but it was it it let us know that we were on its turf. <laughs> yeah. At least that's the way we took it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I've noticed a trend with interviewing people in the past. They'll have an encounter or an experience in their home state and they travel somewhere else, maybe across, you know, state lines and do a wood knock or a whoop and they get a response immediately. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it could be just coincidence or, you know, these things follow people and maybe there's like a spiritual side to it, like you said about the Native Americans. And that's kind of my belief, too, just from what I've experienced, that there's a spiritual side to this because they seem to show up at the right moment. And, um, yeah, it's it's hard to find them when you actually do research and go looking for them in the woods. And it seems like they find you. Yeah, my my native friends sort of alluded to that that's their perspective that you don't just you're not going to trip across one looking for it then it's it's a different sort of you have to go about it entirely different like you said it's it there is a spirituality to it and things of that yeah right? and i think like if a person is experiencing a lot of activity around their home. Yeah. Maybe you can bump into them because you know, they're there. But as far as just going into any forest, trying to find them, I think that's going to be really hard for people to do. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's just a lot tougher. Uh huh. Exactly. Like I said, that back to 71, my, my account that, that was just happenstance there almost accidental. You know, had I'm sure I would have never seen or heard anything if we we're just walking through the woods. But the the fact that it walked up on me, you could tell by its reaction, it was almost it caught it off guard that that had happened. So, you know, it wasn't by design. It was just happenstance. Yeah. And did you guys see any wildlife in the area? Did you guys kill any deer, see any deer? There, very few, very, very few. Yeah. Back then, you hardly ever saw white-tailed deer around here. Now they're a lot more numerous. But. Mm -hmm. And this was early in the morning or in the evening? Yeah, yeah, just yeah, just you know, no, it was November, and so the, just after sunrise. Mm -hmm. And what's the temperature in November in East Texas that time of year? Well, well, that, that morning is probably about 50 or so. So it was just one of those mornings that was crisp and cool, felt really good. Yeah. But I, I did notice when I heard this thing, when I heard it walking, that 
everything else sort of got quiet. But then that, that might be true if a man were walking through the woods making that so you know, the, all the, the noises, how the bird, squirrel, stuff like that, all the other critters that were around that morning. But when I started hearing the footfalls, everything else got pretty quiet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I was really able to focus on them coming toward me. Did you tell your dad anything or your brothers? No, no. Like I said, I didn't. I, I couldn't even begin to digest what had happened. So I never really said anything until many, many, many years later, and only then after that, the Colorado event that, so um, two thousand. So yeah. Uh, that happened, uh, what happened here in East Texas, that was in 71. So it took the 2000 event to really make me even mention it to anybody for the first time, what had happened in 71, so that yeah. many years later. Yeah. Because, so that was really the trigger for me when, it, because it was just valid, validation of what I'd seen. Yeah, that makes sense. And did your family continue hunting in that area? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, did you worry Definitely. about their safety whenever they mentioned that they um, were going to Davy yeah, Crockett? No, no I'd, I'd be worried more about other other hunters than, than some sort of wild animal bothering, or an animal, Sasquatch bothering someone. Because yeah. there are a lot of people that go into the woods here that are pretty undisciplined, so to speak. But like I said, in my dad's military background, we were always taught to respect the woods and respect other people. So we're the, yeah. the way it always was for me. So. Yeah, it sounds like the Sasquatch was either traveling through the area, trying to figure out what you guys were, or hunting, just like you guys were. Well, the one thing all, that I, the I, I thought of too in recent times is the Trinity River. It just, they'd really, that was 71 and 69, they had finished damming the Trinity River and that had created Lake Livingston. And so that really changed the lay of the land around there in terms of where, you know, waterways were and wildlife probably, you know, it altered that to some degree. So, who knows if that had anything to do with it because of the fact that there was suddenly a really, really large lake in this neck of the woods that hadn't been there before. Yeah, that's a good point, and it could be. All right, Dave, I think that pretty well covers your story. Do you have anything else to add or any questions for me? Uh, oh, no, I, I really appreciate your time, and I'm, I'm glad things did work out today. <laughs> A moment there, it looked like they weren't, and I thought I'd hate to put him off again after 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 we finally got this thing set up. Yeah. But it's funny every time the like I said, I talked to someone about this before a phone interview, and every time I do it, it seems like it conjures up more thoughts or mem memories from that from that day and both that day and the the Colorado event. That I'll remember something that I hadn't thought you. Um, before well, once once you have something like that happen and i know i mentioned this so it it gets under your skin and there's just no way to ever forget it yeah it, it yeah does. it gets in it, your blood like a, it, yeah you get the bug and you just want to find out more and find out what other people experience and how they dealt with it and then there's so many cases where i'll go god that's exactly how i felt or that's exactly the sound, what I saw, what it, the sound it made and stuff like that. So a lot of similarities in some of the reports and some of them actually give me the goose flesh when I read them or hear them. And those are the ones that I know. I think that's, that's for real. They really had an encounter and it's not mistaken identity or something like that. When I feel that sort of emotional reaction. Yeah. Yeah. I completely understand. And, Many stories sound oddly familiar, for sure. All right, Dave. Well, I right, appreciate well, your time. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise. You take good care. Yeah, you too, and stay out of the heat. <laughs> Trying to. 
All right. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Have a good one. All right, Dave. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate you for sharing your encounter. I've heard a lot of reports where the Sasquatch will come in from the downwind side, just like regular predators. So they are physical creatures, but we all have to keep in mind that there's something otherworldly going on. All right, next up we have Michael from Idaho, and he wanted to share his experiences that he had while hunting up in the mountains of Idaho. So let's get straight into that. Michael, welcome to Sasquatch Theory. How are you doing today, sir? Doing really great. Doing really good today. Good to hear. You had an encounter while hunting in Idaho. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Well, if you would, just tell us a little bit about yourself and the encounter from the very beginning, if you would. Sure. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a, I'm a city kid. I'm originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, joined the military, was able to work through the ranks in the military. Uh, all of my active duty career was in special operations. And I am a combat veteran, which sort of, as the so story goes along with my encounter, sort of plays into, you know, some of the idiosyncrasies of the encounter. Um, in 2015, uh, a buddy of mine, Eric, and I were hunting in central Idaho right off of South Fork of the Payette River in a remote Forest Service campground that's at a dead-end road. So it's not like a drive-through where you can pull off camp and then people can come and go as they please. This is the campground is the turnaround. Uh, in late September, um, we had... Uh, bear hunting tags. So uh, we decided to go up and check this area out. It's an area I had been to a few times and, you know, nothing creeper and nothing unexplainable had happened until this particular hunting trip. Uh, we get there Friday morning. Um, we are the only people in the campground. There are no other vehicles, no, you know, just no other hunters, no other vehicles, just us. Saturday morning, we wake up before the sun comes up and we start heading north along a, a Forest Service trail that on the left or west side of the river, South Fork of the Payette, is a three mile hike way back up in there to a remote hot springs. On the east side of the river is just wilderness, uh, just you know, nothing to go see. So we made the decision to get off of any trails. We crossed the river and we were probably about a half a mile to three quarters of a mile from the campground, working our way through the brush. No trails, no nothing. And I had heard something coming through and it's a pretty thick wooded area up there in central Idaho. Uh, heard something coming through the wilderness, and I told my buddy, kind of gestured, there was a fallen pine tree, and I said, hey, like, let's get down below the pine tree, and we'll wait for whatever's coming through the woods to present itself, um, and then we'll figure, if it's a bear, obviously we have bear tanks, we'll shoot it. If it's an elk, it'll be an area that I'll come back and use for elk hunting, because it did sound pretty big. Um, so we got down behind the, the pine tree and, you know, not that long, probably a few minutes, um, whatever was coming stopped moving in our direction and then went silent. So I gestured to Eric, let's move in its direction. You know, if it winded us or smelled us, it couldn't have seen us because we were laying in the prone position behind a fallen tree. Um, you know, we'll jump it. And again, same thing. If it's a bear, we have bear tags. If it's an elk, I know that I'll come back up here and hunt again. So we start moving in its direction. We're moving uphill northeast uh, and we're climbing what essentially is kind of like rolling foothills up to some higher peaks. Uh, still very thick, very wooded. And Eric is ahead of me while moving 
and he gestures probably from where we heard something coming, probably another 75 to 100 yards up through the thicket. Um, from an uphill position, Eric sort of turned to me startled and he said, did you just see that? And I hadn't seen it, so it wasn't anything that I needed to worry about. And I was like, no, like what? And he said, something just threw a pine cone from those bushes up there. Uh, the bushes at that point were probably about 50 yards away from us, 35 to 50 yards away from us. Very thick, like six, seven foot high, really green, really thick vegetation on the on the slope of this hill. So, and I, I was like, no, I didn't see it. So he picked up the pine cone and it was green. And I think the significance to the green pine cone is it wasn't a mature pine cone dropping its seeds. And it had three or four little needles on it to suggest something pulled it off of a tree to throw it, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm suddenly intrigued. Um, uh, and Eric is also, Eric and I are both carrying uh, rifles and sidearms. So we're pretty well armed. Um, so I, I was like, well, let's walk in that direction. Like, let's see what's up there. So we start moving in that direction. And now my attention is on the thicket. Eric is still ahead of me. And at this point, um, and it, it just literally popped into my head. At this point, when he and I were talking about the pine cones, I was pointing out to him our entire walk through the wilderness where we were, the whole mile to mile and a half walk. You had ambient noises, a lot of squirrels doing their chirping, letting everybody else know that we're in the area. And after the pine cone got thrown, uh, I was like, Eric, do you notice that? And he was like, what? I was like, do you hear anything? And initially he was like, well, no. What do you mean do I hear anything? I'm like, do you hear any squirrels or anything? And he kind of like put his ear up. He's like, no. And at the time, that didn't really, I was just kind of like, well, that's different. Let's keep going. So we take a few more steps towards this big thicket area. Again, we're moving uphill. And I physically see, and so did Eric, because our attention is on this really thick bush, a bigger than a softball, but smaller than a cantaloupe-sized rock come out of those bushes in Eric's direction as if you were throwing like an underhand softball pitch in an arc uh, landed within feet of Eric. Um, and at this point, he literally freezes, turns to me and is looking directly at me. And I do a gesture, like a military gesture, didn't say anything, where I nod my hands, like, keep going. Um, Eric. He looks at me and he's like, and he, we keep moving. And a few things were sort of going on with me at this point. I went from, you know, when you're a hunter and you're moving through the wilderness and you're sort of still scouting, your, your weapon is not at the ready. You don't have a round in the chamber. You're not on fire because you're not going to be shooting at anything. And I was at a little bit higher state of alert once I saw that rock come out where I put my hunting weapon in my shoulder, pointing it directly at the bush, and Eric is ahead of me. And then we take a few more steps closer to the bush. And at this point, with Eric being ahead of me, he's pretty close to this bush, like within 20 feet. And now my mind is starting to be like, well, what if something jumps out at him I won't be able to shoot it and kill it before it gets on top of them. But we're still kind of moving forward. And then from my, and I'm, if you can imagine from my 12 o'clock position walking uphill, a, an entirely different to my right, a three o'clock position from a different location, a rock or something like a rock 
went past my field of vision like a softball, not, not a softball, like a major league baseball player. It's no longer in an arcing position. It is moving with some speed. It went right past my field of vision. It so it basically split Eric and I. And I look up to the right, and I'm looking into the wilderness. Like, I don't physically see anything. I don't physically see anybody. And I turn to Eric, and Eric is looking at me, and his eyeballs are the size of baseballs. He's just like, what is going on? What are we doing? And we need to get the hell out of here. So we sort of come to the conclusion, like, whatever's going on, we can't explain. But from two separate locations, we're getting objects thrown at us. And the last one is at a little more higher paced. Like, you know, if that thing hit me in the temple, who the hell knows what it would have. Eric would have had to get me out of there. So we you know, make the real quick, hasty decision, make a hard left, go directly down the hill, breaking brush along the way. And then when we get to the bottom where the river is, there's a relatively large marshy area that we kind of walked through, got soaking wet, walked through. And then we stood and basically looked at each other in the river. We, I physically walked into the river. And he, he's like, what, is, what was that? And I'm like, I don't know. Did you see anything? And he was like, no. And there were some things going on in my head while I was up there. And and I've told the story to probably two or three people. And they were like, well, how close were you? And I'm like, like really close. What I would consider danger close. And they're like, well, why didn't you shoot? I'm like, I didn't see anything. I mean, God forbid it was a feral human being that lives up there you know then we just shot somebody that's been throwing rocks at us and they're like really like were there any other cars in the campground like what would make you think there were other people up there and i'm like the fact that things are being thrown you know bears elk deer racket they don't throw things um and then I did not notice this, but on our exit, when we were moving directly down the hill away from where this occurrence happened, Eric said it sounded like something was on his right side. I was on his left. Something was on his right side, basically pacing us down the hill. And I didn't hear that, so I can't say yes, I definitely heard that. But he said it sounded like something was walking us down the hill. Uh, We wound up getting back to our campsite probably by lunch one o'clock sort of like uh we can't explain what just happened we wound up spending the rest of the afternoon and then we moved into another area to kind of you know we're up there for hunting so we kind of did the afternoon hunt to see if we can walk around um nothing happened didn't see here or anything unusual happened and then that night we basically were like we're not staying I, I don't know what just happened. I'm very uneasy at this point, And we need to get out of here. Like something, like between the two of us, we're like, we just need to go home. And then we wound up uh, packing up that night. And basically Friday by 10 o'clock, we were like headed home. Okay. Yeah, I think that was Bigfoot from your explanation. And I appreciate you sharing your experience with me. Michael? Yeah, very, a uh, very, just a uh, very different. Like I didn't, I had never had anything like to happen to me before, so I didn't really know how to react to it, and just other than get out of this area, whatever's going on doesn't want us here, and we need to just leave. Yeah, yeah, I understand, and um, I appreciate your service, by the way. Um, let's see, I have a few questions here. Could you smell anything in the area when you guys were up there? No, nothing uh, that would stand out to me that was, oh, like, what is that odor? And I, you know, and, you know, I'm an avid hunter and I know what elk smell like when you get close to an elk. When you're archery hunting, you can smell them. They smell like the zoo is the only thing I can think. Um, And that I didn't, 
didn't smell anything out of the ordinary. No. Okay. So after the second rock was thrown, is that when you guys left the area? Yeah, I just was not uh, committed or ready to just blindly shoot into a tree line. Um, I was feeling that, and this is an assumption on my part, that it went from underhand softball pitch, like, hey, you guys are getting close, don't be here, to we continue to move in that area. And then the fact that there were more than one, because the one directly in the, the thicket that, through the rock the first rock could not have moved from that position to another position without us seeing it or hearing it we were within again 20 feet from that thicket we would have heard it run up the hill to get into another position further away from us so i made the deduction there's more than one yeah absolutely that was the feeling that i got when you told the story and um how big did you say the rocks were? About grapefruit size, softball size? Uh, larger than a softball, but small, you know, not quite watermelon size. I'd almost put it at a cantaloupe size um, and fell within feet of Eric. Yeah. The, the one that was moving at a higher rate of speed to my, my three o'clock or my right side that was more like palm sized rock. Okay. Yeah. That and is... that, that went directly across my field of vision. Cause I had my rifle in my shoulder with the sights aimed at that bush in case something charged at Eric, uh-huh. but I would be able to get a shot or two off. Right. Yeah. So that's how I noticed it going past my field of vision. Cause I was like it full alert. Okay. The first rock that was thrown, was that coming from downhill? And the second one, was that kind of going, I don't know, um, uphill, would you say? Yeah. Both rocks were came from an uphill position, um, and we were in the downhill position. We were moving uphill when this whole thing happened. And it's... It's not like three point contact uphill, like we weren't scrambling, but it's kind of steep. Yeah. And um, do you think a person could have thrown a rock like that? It is possible the size of the rock not being, you know, a 300 pound boulder. Yes, it is possible that a human being could have thrown the softball size rock and then a human being could have thrown the second faster pitch rock for sure. Um, I, I, and Eric and I have talked about like who would be up there and who would be throwing rocks at people with weapons. Yeah. Good point. And the fact that they threw a green pine cone, that's pretty strange too. I think they chose that because they can throw it farther than a, a dried up one. Oh, yeah. Or it was, you know, I guess if we're going to make a sun, like it was right there. Whatever was in that thicket turned around, grabbed it, and then was like, hey, these guys are getting close. Yeah. What do you think would have happened if you would have continued going up the hill? I think in my, my military mind goes to I would have been in a firefight. Obviously, they don't have weapons, but I would have probably been engaging something for life and limb. Yeah. Especially with the, the second rock coming at the rate of speed it did and not at my feet, at my head. Yeah, it sounds like they didn't want you guys up there. I wonder what they had going on, if it was just like juveniles, food, or maybe there was like a dead one up there. I I frequent that area. Uh, um, this, this experience hasn't scared me. It's made me a little bit more alert when I do, uh, I practice field craft. I love the wilderness. Uh, I go up, I spend days on end with a hammock and live off the land. Um, I get to practice some of the skills that the military taught me and I still do that. And I do it in that area, 
I just am at a higher state of alert while doing it. And kind of not my story, but in the same sort of ballpark, about four months later, a good friend of mine who lives in the town that you drive through this town and then you get on the Forest Service Road and then you go north to where the campground is. A friend of mine lives in that town. His name is Guy. And he sent me an email. So this happened in late September, early October. In January of the same, you know, just a few months later, he knew my story because he lives up there. And I was like, like, do you guys ever talk about this stuff when you're at the local watering hole? He's like, no, not really. But in the, the January, just a few months later, he sent me an email and he said, you're not going to believe this. And he recounted a story of his friend that had barefooted footprints in the snow of his driveway that came up from a creek bed to his driveway, walked up the driveway for like six or seven strides, and then made a left turn and went up into the wilderness. And this is an area that people have their rental cabins and their vacation cabins. So there's, you know, a few speckled around this area. And he's like, you're not going to believe it that his buddy that he works with, he's like, yeah, he left for work because he's a mechanic, had to be to work early. His wife is an administrator at the school. She left like an hour and a half later. And from the time he left to when she left, something walked up their driveway with bare feet and then went up the hillside. Yeah, that is cool. And, um, I hear a lot of reports about that same type of phenomenon happening in the mountain ranges, you know, such as Washington, Mm -hmm. Idaho, Montana. And, um, yeah, it seems like they get really close to people. Yeah. I think, I think in this case, we may have come across what could have been a group that were, you know, maybe bedded down or kind of hunkering down because we're moving through the woods and we just, we made the turn that put us in the direct path of where they were and they wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah. I've never seen a rock get thrown at me. I've had, I don't know. There was this one time where I thought a rock got thrown and I seen it in my peripheral. And when I looked over the sapling was moving back and forth, it sounded like a rock, but I'm not sure. But I think I've experienced it like one or two times, but I hear a lot of stories from people where they throw rocks and often people feel threatened when, when they experience that activity. It is, it's a very strange feeling of being that remote and God forbid if something were to go tragically wrong. Uh, And just in any case, you know, like if, you know, because it's just Eric and I, we're probably, if there's a serious injury, we're probably two hours from the truck. Then we got to do first trauma, first aid there. And then we're another three hour drive from any formal clinic. And when I saw, I was just like, like your brain can't comp, like, what? Like, I just saw a rock come out of that bush and that's the underhand softball one because i saw it leave the bush and my brain is like what is going on like and eric turns to me he's even closer to it and his eyeballs are huge he's you know in shock i don't know whatever term you would use for it yeah and i'll go ahead sorry well, just, you know, just a little, I've, like, I'm a combat veteran. I've run into buildings where people, I know people are going to be shooting at me when I go in the building. 
And I've, I, I've done that. I'm, I'm retired military. But out there in that situation, I was just like, I was confused. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Your brain gets warped when you experience the activity. It's just like, it's trying to find an answer to, to what you're experiencing. hundred mm-hmm. percent. My mind was running through a million scenarios. What if it's a feral person? What if it's another hunter from another ridge? You got lost. And being from the East Coast, uh, originally from Pennsylvania, I hunted in Pennsylvania. I've come across other hunters in the wilderness. And generally, there's like a courtesy, like, hey, we're in here. Don't shoot us. They don't throw shit at you. They they announce that you're in their area. You know, you give a gesture and you move on to another hillside or get out of the, you know, out of that area completely. Nothing. Yeah. And you've experienced a lot of things in this world. And when you came across these creatures, you knew that it was something unusual, something off. You, you broke up there. I didn't get that last part. Okay. No, I was saying that you've been through a lot and experienced things that most people won't ever experience. And when you came across these creatures, you couldn't gauge what it was. And it it had you stumped, even with everything you've experienced in your life, all the training you've had. And, you know, you've been trained to observe things. Yeah. Okay. What do you think these creatures are? Or beings, should I say? (laughs) I went pretty far down the rabbit hole. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. I started, started like, what can, what is this? How does this happen? And then obviously it triggers onto a Bigfoot Sasquatch phenomenon. And in all of what I've read and all of the specials I've seen, um, I think somewhere in the evolutionary bush that we call humans, there is a side branch that never developed past, you know, hominid or Neanderthal type behavior. I think they are a cousin to humans um, that know living deep remotely in the wilderness is that's just where they are. I think they they follow game animals. I think they follow the elk when it starts snowing and the elk and deer come down, down off of the highlands. I think they follow them down because that's their food source. And I think that's what was happening because, you know, September, October, November in Idaho is when everything starts moving. Yeah. And um, I've heard from a lot of hunters that the Sasquatch are more aggressive during the hunting season. And that could have been the case. Maybe you guys were hunting the same food source as these creatures or possibly they were moving through the area and you guys bumped into them. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think it's probably more along. uh, We ran into them moving through that area because within two and a half months in January down where the rental cabins and vacation cabins are is where barefooted footprints came up on, you know, a friend of mine's buddy's driveway. And they didn't make a big to do about it at all. They were just like, Oh, well, this is odd. Kind of went about their day, but Carlson's guy, Carlson, he's like, dude, you're not going to believe this. (laughs) Cause I told them my story in October. Yeah, that is interesting. Do you go out pursuing these creatures now? You mentioned you went back to the area a bunch of times, and um, did you find find anything, see anything unusual? <laughs> um, I have been. That's one of my favorite areas to go to recreate. Um, the hot springs out there is amazing, and I've probably since 2015. I've probably been up there 60 or 70 times. Um, I've done field craft up there where I hike in with a hammock, set up a little tiny fire and spend a day or two just kind of checking out. Um, I have, and, and, you know, unfortunately it was on a telephone, two telephones ago, uh, cell phones 
on one of my hikes back in there with two friends of mine, um, but on the path to the hot springs as you're cutting through the woods, was in this gravelly, muddy area what looked like a barefooted footprint that was kind of cockeyed to the trail, like it basically was going across the trail, wasn't using the trail at all. And I have uh, two German Shepherds. You may have heard them barking their heads off outside a second ago. I have two German Shepherds that I take into the field with me for obvious reasons. And I took my camera out to take a picture of the footprint. And because the dog saw me stop and paying attention to something at my feet, they ran over to see what it was. And they trampled the footprint. (laughs) So... I did take a photograph of it, which I also do not have because I don't have that phone anymore. But even that was a little bit broken up with dog prints kind of right in the center of it. Um, That's the only other. And my friends who are completely have no experience. We were just going hiking to a hot springs. They're like, yeah, that literally looks like a barefoot. And they're like shrugged it off and like, all right, well, let's keep going. The dogs weren't alerted or anything. They weren't worried or cringing. We just did the walk, soaked in the hot springs and walked out. Yeah, I've had similar experiences where we find a track and the dog notices that everyone's paying attention to that spot and it goes up there and ruins the track. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Um, Where did you serve in the military, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I was in the Marine Corps. Uh, I was part of force reconnaissance in the Marine Corps out of Camp Pendleton. Okay. Did you see anything strange while you were there? Anything on any tours, cryptids, UFOs, anything like that? No, nothing. I mean, we were, you know, what they call door kickers. Like we're, we don't do a lot of like remote patrolling and running around like we get called to go in and eliminate targets and the, the combat theater of action that I had was all urban. Like I I have no, I did go to a jungle survival school over in Asia, in the Philippines. Um, but nothing there that, that would jump out at me as an unusual occurrence while in the field. Yeah. And when you had the rock throwing experience, how did that make you feel about everything you've learned, you know, in school and life and in the military? Do you feel like there's missing aspects of information that's not being told to people? Um, maybe not missing aspects of information that I've learned, but definitely confused. Like what is going on? Like this, like what is going on? I'm, I just physically saw that. What is going on? Mm -hmm. And were you a doubter before this or were you pretty open-minded? A what? Were you a doubter before this? You know, were you skeptical or? Um, I wouldn't say skeptical. I didn't believe per se. And you know, Bigfoot and all of those phenomenons to me were entertainment for the lack of a better term. Like, Oh, you know, these guys are talking about it. I love wilderness and you know, all of that stuff. So yeah, it interests me, but a non-believer, it was just more entertainment than it was any investment for me. But definitely now I'm definitely a believer that there is something that lives and moves in the remote wildernesses of North America. Yeah, absolutely. And this happened in 2015, but um, you say you're you're out there all the time or you go into the woods every now and then? Oh, yeah, all the time. Okay, you'll have to let me know if you experience more activity since you're out there oh, quite a bit. Oh, yeah, for sure. And And now that I have a little bit more... You know, now that we've been in contact and I have your number, if I if I come across a print, I won't hold on to it. Like, I'll take a picture and send it to you and give you the details. Um, and even further out, like, as, as again, I've gone down the rabbit hole 
Like I've been doing research on areas, not just in the area that my occurrence happened, which there have been multiple occurrences over the years in the exact location mine happened, but even further north in areas even more and more remote, like the Frank Church Wilderness Area. Um, and that's just informational, like, oh, hey, we're going to go do some off-roading back here. We're going to go across the Lolo Pass, and then I'll be like, let me see if there's any occurrences around the Lolo Pass. Um, but, yeah, it, it definitely interests me. And when I go somewhere now, I'll try to see if there's something that has ever happened there so that I'm a little bit more ahead of the game and not being surprised by something thrown at me in the wilderness. Yeah, absolutely. And when you mentioned hot springs, like are we talking about springs? Like if you jump in, it's going to boil you alive or just warm water? No. So they are soaking pools. They are natural. Um, they are like shotgun speckled all over Idaho because of the geothermal activity below us. Um, and some are hot enough if they don't draw water from a river source. There are some that will burn you. Uh, this particular one is, it, for me, it's perfect. It's a nice three-mile hike, three mile hike in. I mean, every time I've been there, I've been by myself or unless the people I've taken. Um, and it's just perfect. There's a cold water source right there that, you know, kind of filters in. So it's not super, super hot. But it's, you know, it's a eight or nine person soaker. So it's it's really nice. Yeah. Yeah, that is cool. Um, did you use night vision goggles on your deployment? Yes. Okay. Do you know of any brands that civilians can buy that are high end? Oh, shoot. I um, used to use Armasite. I had a scope and it actually looked pretty good. I don't know what gen it was, but it was pretty impressive. I sold it back in the day, but I, I regret it. I, I wish I didn't. Sorry. I got tongue tied there. Yeah. Um, no, not nothing offhand other than probably just Googling it. I know back in the day I had an ATN. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that, that acronym is for. Uh, ATN makes uh, night vision scopes for hunting. Um, I think that is, in the state of Idaho, it's illegal to use any assistance with a scope. Like You can't even use the daylighter scopes that just even light up your crosshairs. No. You can't even use those here. So... Yeah, that is tricky. Okay. No, I, I had to ask just because I've been looking around and there's all kinds of different brands, gens, and price ranges. And I didn't really know which one was the good one. Okay. Well, I think that pretty well covers most of your encounter. Do you have any questions for me, Michael? No, I really appreciate the opportunity to share it with you. And again... You know, now, now that we're in contact, as I am, you know, taking my time checking out and getting back into the wilderness, if anything comes up, I'll definitely let you know. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good to me. And I really appreciate your time and your willingness to get in contact with me and share your experiences with, with everyone. Yep. All right. You have yourself a good one. And it was a too, pleasure have... speaking with you. Same. Have a great fourth and I'll be in touch. Yeah. Same to you, man. Take care. All right, Michael, thank you very much for sharing your experiences here on Sasquatch Theory, and I appreciate your service as well. I'm also glad you didn't get hurt in this situation because I have heard of people getting hurt by the Sasquatch, and you never know. The reason I say that is the rock that they threw, or the rocks, were pretty big compared to... Um, most reports I hear around here where they throw like a pebble or just a pine cone or a few pine cones, whatever it may be. And in your case, it was a rather large rock. And if that would have hit you, it definitely would have hurt you. And, um, yeah, I'm glad things didn't go down that way. But yeah, if you ever experience anything else up there, see anything, definitely get in contact with me. And I'd like to hear more 
about this area if possible. But all right, guys, that's all I have for today. And I really appreciate everyone for listening as always. So until the next one, thank you everyone and be safe.